Okay, today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Last time we studied verses 8 through 16, so we're going to pick up the study at verse 17. And I'll give you a preview. We're going to find three main ideas as we go through the rest of the chapter. And we're going to cover the first two of those today. And namely that Jesus claims equality with God the Father, and he has supreme power over life and death. So those are pretty, pretty heavy-duty topics. So uh, I'm reading from the New King, Chan New King James Translation. <clears throat> if you'd like to follow along, Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought to kill him all the more, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he, he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation finishing up at verse 30 i can of myself do nothing as i hear i judge and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. A lot of good stuff in there. Well, we, had a, we had a great study last time as we dug into uh, the meaning of the Sabbath, the rest that God provided for his people. We knew, uh, know that the Jewish leaders at that time uh, had built up an incredible system of, of bondage and control using an extra Sabbath laws that they had pretty much made up as an excuse. And we also saw a little bit of how Christ has given us a freedom that transcends the human-made laws and frees God people, God's people from bondage to obey and to live under his law. Now, in, incidentally, I, you might find this interesting. I, I discovered another interesting twist that the leaders put in the law back in, the, in ancient Israel, um, Deuteronomy 23, Verses 12 to 13, there was a sanitation law for those in Israel's camp. Apparently this was during a military time, and you'll hear this. It says, you shall have a place outside the camp to which you shall go as a comfort station. And you shall have a paddle or shovel among your weapons. And when you sit down outside to relieve yourself, you shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up what has come from you. I don't need to explain that. But as we discussed in the last study, we read about that God had put a law in place against carrying goods and tribute in and out of your homes through, through the city gates uh, on the Sabbath day. Well, the religious leaders had turned that into meaning that a person couldn't carry almost anything, almost anywhere on the Sabbath. Now, then they extended the sanitation guideline from what I just read to interpret that the city of Jerusalem was literally the camp of the Lord. And thus the little shovel or paddle that they carried uh, uh, 
could not be carried on the Sabbath. You know, okay, yes, you get the picture. That meant, they interpreted it as meaning you could not relieve yourself on the Sabbath day. And I don't even want to find out how that worked out for them, okay? I mean, but you, you do see how particular they, they got about their own rules. And, you know, as, as we know, the beginning of the chapter, Jesus had healed a man. He had told him, basically, you're going home, you're moving, you know, pick up your bed and go. Uh, which his bed was a mat, just a, a light mat there. And uh, thus Jesus was accused uh, of not breaking the Sabbath himself, but of teaching someone else to violate the Sabbath day. And one of the, to violate one of their rules about the Sabbath day, and of course they were furious. Um, so I kind of wonder why they were so mad at Jesus when it was actually the healed man who had been the one that supposedly broke the law. This is kind of one of the ironic aspects to, the, to Jesus' ministry. Um, digging in, we find there are several places in the Hebrew scriptures which refer to a greater punishment being given to someone who leads others astray or causes them to sin. So that was very real, that the person that taught you, that teaches you, that's why they wanted, wanted to know who told you to carry your bed. Um, so even figuratively, we see in, in Leviticus 19, uh, verse 14, you shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. So, you know, this is talking about those that are, that are, that are teaching or those that are uh, putting something in front of someone else. Uh, it's basically it's saying here, you can't do sneaky things, even like cursing at a man who can't hear you curse them or tripping up a man that can't, can't even see that you had put the block in front of them. And this is also taken to extend to spiritual deafness and spiritual blindness. And as such, to teachers that lead people that don't know any better in the wrong direction, whether it's for their own personal gain or just to prove that they have authority or power over somebody, this was wrong to do. Now, write down Deuteronomy 13, to study this out a little bit further, this is a little homework again, um, but uh, there's, a, there's a command to literally to put someone to death who comes and tells you to follow and serve other gods. God was serious about this. It doesn't matter whether the person was a miracle worker or a prophet or even a loved one in your family, a son, a brother, even your cherished spouse. I, I did notice that it did not include your parents because you are to honor your mother and your father. But you're, you're commanded not to spare any of these other people, to hide them or even have pity on them, but to be the first one to stone them. So God was serious about getting people to turn away from following the Lord. A serious effect, uh, offense. In fact, Jesus in, in uh, Matthew 18, 6, he, he himself expands on this concept that he was being accused of. But he said, Matthew 18, 6, But whoever causes one of the little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone, millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's serious. So this is a good time for our first life lesson. And that is, don't cause others to sin or to stray from God. Don't cause others to sin or to stray from God. In John 19, Pilate brought Jesus out before the crowd and declared him to be faultless. Yet the religious leaders shouted out for him to be crucified and got others in the crowd stirred up to do the same, especially since he claimed to be divine. That was their big accusation against him. Now, that scared Pilate even more when they said, he claimed to be God, he's, he's blaspheming. <laughs> because Pilate's like, I haven't found anything wrong with this guy, and this might be God. You know, Pilate scared, scared to death almost that he might end up killing God himself. He didn't know what to do, but he was a little bit of a, a weak spine person. And in verse 11, when he was asking, you know, telling Jesus that, hey, you know, I have the power to kill you. You know, what do you say for yourself? Jesus answered, 
You could have no power at all unless, against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered to me, delivered me to you has the greater sin. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. And so again, Jesus wholeheartedly agreed with the religious leaders in our text that causing another to sin, to do wrong, is a grave offense. But he also knew that the real problem here was one of authority. Was it the authority of God himself that was being sinned against? Or was it the supposed authority of men that were claiming to speak for God that was the issue? After all, the same God who gave the commandment to honor the day of rest that they were so picky about had also said in Deuteronomy 12, 32, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it or take away from it. Now, I think we all realize by now that they had added an incredible number of volumes to the commandments God had said, that God had spoken and went way beyond uh, even what Father God himself would have interpreted it to be, the, the, the laws to be. So <laughs> it was interesting. At this time, it was time for Jesus to be very clear that his authority was the authority of God himself and was exponentially higher than man's authority. So that's where we see this turn. Verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. Verse 18, therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Okay, now it's on, okay? It's out in the open without apology, without ambiguity. Jesus tells him, tells them that he and his father, God, had been working these miracles. And did you notice? We don't see a rebuttal. We don't see that they were denying that Jesus had done the miracle. We don't see that they denied that the power to do that miracle was coming from God. These were indisputable. They knew it. The people around them knew it. They knew God had healed the lame man through Jesus. They criticized him because part of the process actually was in conflict with their man-made rules and they did not want to let anything go. Jesus didn't want to leave it there though, just with, with a man-made rule being the end of the story. If they were going to discredit him, if they were going to want to kill him, they'd have to do it not because they were upholding the laws of man, but he turned it, so now they wanted to kill him because he had claimed and proven that he was indeed the very God whose laws these hypocrites were claiming to uphold. <laughs> you know, I, I find Jesus is, has a great sense of humor, and at the same time, the authority he has is incredible. It's like, you're not going to get me for your rules. You're going to get me because I'm God. Uh, and you do not honor and respect God. We'll see that more as we go along. So, you know, guys, I, I always tell you this. If the Bible teaches something that's different than what we've been taught before or contrary even to our political leanings, that we should intentionally choose to believe the Bible and adjust our uh, religious and political views to align with biblical teaching, to align with God's teaching. And that's where these religious leaders went wrong. So life lesson for us here today is... When in conflict, always be sure that your words and actions line up with what the entire Word of God teaches. When in conflict, always be sure that your words and actions line up with what the entire Word of God teaches. Now, while it's an honor and a blessing to be able to help others to know what the Word of God says, it's also something you should be careful about doing it when it affects people's lives and, of course, their spiritual lives. I mean, you might say, you know, I've heard and fill in the blank about something you thought maybe was in the Bible or a verse that I read says, and then fill in the blank, but, the, but leave out the rest of what's in that. Well, if you're sharing with somebody that's honestly seeking guidance, you should take the time and find out more and study more. Okay. Sometimes that's not the easiest thing to do. You just want to give an answer that makes either makes you feel good or makes them feel good or might be something you heard somewhere else but you want to find out what god really has to say now 
Fortunately today, we are blessed. It's pretty easy. We have online, you know, internet. We have online references. Uh, we have handheld smartphones. I mean, I got a little phone here, a little device here that uh, God has inspired someone to make that allows me to go. And you can do it on computers as well. You can go to websites uh, by good people, such as Blue Letter Bible or Bible Gateway, which have, have some excellent helps and, and uh, you know, don't go way off on the deep ends. <laughs> you also have smartphone apps like the U Bible, U Version Bible. They have a lot of helps built in. Um, and uh, also, I like the new Gideon Bible app that's out there. There's a whole section, help in time of need and help with life's problems. You just tap on it and it will read you verses straight from the Bible that have been selected as being, you know, actually applicable to different needs that people have. So we want to know, the bottom line here is, you know, study things out. Those are just some short, some easier ways to do it, but you do want to study further as you can. And we want to be like, uh, we really want to know what God has to say about these things, even if we don't like them particularly. Uh, and we can be like the Apostle Paul. We can say, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that after this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. That's in Acts 20, verses 20 to 27. In our text, we're actually seeing literally what Paul was talking about here. The religious leaders were trying to draw disciples after themselves. These are the very people that are commissioned with seeking out the whole counsel of God and nothing but the whole counsel of God, and then communicating that to the people that are under their care. And instead, they turn their positions into a way to draw people away from the Lord Jesus Christ and to themselves. That's what they were trying to do. It wasn't working very good, so they were getting very upset. Well. What we should do, let's, let's get away from what they were doing a little bit. And let's look at what we should be doing. We should look at things like uh, what John the Baptizer was doing, specifically pointing people to follow Jesus. And when there's a conflict between the two, say, I'm just here to point to him rather than trying to make a conflict. We maintain our credibility by only speaking the truth that comes from God the Father. And, you know, we're going to see in the next few verses that even Jesus does that. So uh, we're going to get into that in a moment. But our life lesson for us is speaking the word of God directs people to Jesus, not to us. Speaking the word of God directs people to Jesus, not to us. So let's see what Jesus said about that in verse 19. We continue in our text. Then Jesus answered and said unto him, said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. So we see here that the Son conforms to the Father. How? Well, first, he's obedient to the Father's will. He does nothing of himself and is entirely devoted to the Father's will. Second, he observes his father's counsel. That is, he does nothing that he doesn't see his father do. And notice also that it's not just, you know, do what I say, but it's do what I do. He does nothing he doesn't see the father do. There's a plan. There's a right way to do things. And in our, even in, our, uh, in, in the disciples' prayer that we read in Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10, we see the familiar phrase, In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That parallel, what we see the Father do, we do. We even pray that that, that will happen. So it wasn't just flowery oratory coming out of the mouth of Jesus, uh, you know, just to have something pretty sounding, although it does, it is beautiful to our ears as, as we love the Lord. But this was the way that he lived. 
And it's the way that we can live also. And the third thing it, it talks about, Jesus is equal with the Father with the same authority, wisdom, liberty, and power as a result of being obedient and following his Father's counsel. Jesus has a full authority and command over nature, over everything in the universe, and knows the heart of every person better than we know ourselves. Got a lot of life lessons, and that brings us to the next one, and that is obey God's will and seek his counsel. You will be blessed to walk in his authority, wisdom, and power. Obey God's will and seek his counsel. Then you will be blessed to walk in his authority, wisdom, and power. So just as Jesus does not act independently of Father, we see a reciprocation from the Father towards the Son. In, in verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things that he does, that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now this, this is so rich. You know, the Father loves the Son. Even in the midst, this, you know, think about where they're at. They're in the middle of hatred being thrown at them. You know, just twice in, before he started talking, twice, you know, we see where these people are wanting to kill him. <laughs> and yet, in the midst of this hatred, and these are, it's from the people that should be showing him the most respect. Jesus knows that his Father loves him and always will love him. Another thing we see is that the Father reveals to Jesus all the things he does. So that's from the Father's end. We saw earlier the Son sees and observes, and now we see the Father intentionally reveals these things to him. Got the Father involved? Jesus, the Son, from the very beginning of creation. We studied that in our very first study in the book of John, the Gospel of John, way back in the first verses of the Gospel of John, and uh, as we look back in Genesis, we saw that. We saw the involvement of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is found throughout the Bible. Now, the, the next thing is that the Father reveals to Jesus the things not only that he's doing, but also that will be happening in the future. Jesus says, greater things than these that you may marvel. Again, even those that sought to do away with Jesus could not help but recognize and be amazed or marvel at the great miracles he was performing. Now, I, 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 may, I may say performing uh, a little hesitantly sometimes because it has such a connotation nowadays of entertainment and, uh, and stage acting. <clears throat> But it literally means performing, when I say performing miracles and performing signs or wonders, um, it literally means to carry out, accomplish, or fulfill a task. In other words, to do good works. And that's exactly what he's doing. And he's telling them that soon they'll see even greater things than they've already seen. Changing the molecular structure of water into wine. Speaking, telling a man his son telling a man to go his way and his son being healed 30 miles away, 20 miles away. Or just telling a man, lame man to get up and walk and he walks away. So there's some pretty incredible things that they're going to see. Our, another life lesson here that we get from what Jesus is talking about his father is God loves you no matter what your circumstances and he is showing you great works he is doing all around you and you will see even greater works. And I think that applies no matter where you're at in life, what stage of life you're in. Whether you've been a believer for 50, 60 years, or whether you are just now thinking about becoming a believer in the Lord, God loves you no matter what your circumstances, and he is showing you great works that he is doing all around, and you will see even greater works. Now, what does he mean? He doesn't leave you guessing. He explains it. Verse 21 and 22, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. That's pretty powerful. You know, think about all the fantastic things that God has allowed mankind to accomplish over the centuries. Uh, you know, we think about, we talking about the little tiny technological marvels that we can carry in our pockets um, and, and all the way up to great buildings and vast cities 
that he's allowed man to plan and visit and I, I just gives me a headache when I think about uh, even a small small city how all the the wires and all the you know plumbing and the sewer and everything gets to where it needs to go in the communications and yet there are vast cities that God's allowed mankind to build that have all of his stuff uh, and then travel from traveling by foot to riding animals to, to getting in carts and then caravans and and then there's trains and and then cars individually and then you know, going into buses and trucks and airplanes and now people even travel in spaceships. You know, last week, another one of our spaceships landed on Mars and sent back pictures of what was out there. Then we see things like medical marvels. Um, first, you know, finding plants that have healing properties and giving man wisdom to do that and, and, um, and then creating pain relieving medication. And, and then like I had done a couple years ago, taking parts out, rearranging parts, fixing problems, and putting them all back together inside bodies to give you a life extension procedures. I mean, it's amazing what, what medically what, what's happening and what continues to happen. But even with all of that, what happens when it's time for us to meet our maker and be laid to rest? <laughs> there ain't nobody with no technology, with any technology that we have anywhere that can take a dead and rotting body, cause it to move again, and breathe life into it. And here, more than 2,000 years after Jesus came, we can't even begin to pretend to know how to call out a person who's been dead in the ground for several days, cause life to come back into them, cause their body systems to be restored and better than new. But that was what Jesus was talking about. A remarkable thing here is that those listening to Jesus, whether they were for him or whether they were against him, they knew he spoke the truth. When he tells them plainly that he can raise the dead and has the authority to give life to whomever he chooses to give that to, they know, you know, they know it's true. Taking a sneak peek at the end of the chapter, I can even tell you that even though they sought to, to kill Jesus, his words apparently put fear in those that were against him. And, and we don't see his persecutors anymore. I mean, they're not, they're not there or they're just shut up or they're hiding. I don't know where, they're, where they've gone to. The scripture doesn't tell us, but they're gone. They're not seen again. I, I think that's because men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. And they quickly moved out of sight. So let's just continue on and, and see what Jesus is bringing out to those who are staying and listening. Verse 23, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the, honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. God gave, God the Father gave this work, gave this power of life and death and the work of judging who gets that to God the Son so that people would honor and respect Jesus as they should and that they should they should also honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Failing to honor God the Son means it's impossible for one to also honor God the Father who sent the Son. And you'll see that in people's lives. Oh, I don't, you know, I believe in God, but I don't really believe in Jesus, some will say. Well, you see, they can't honor God without honoring Jesus. And Jesus told them that right here. And, but once again, this is a clear claim by Jesus to be divine. This was not something to be taken lightly by anybody that was listening. And at this point, the listener is either totally shocked by Jesus' words, ready to stone him for blasphemy, or is with Jesus, following him, listening to his words, expectantly hanging on everything that he's saying, what the next step is going to be, and ready to follow him completely. There wasn't, you know, Jesus divided people out, all right, at one camp or the other. Our life lesson today for us is you must decide for yourself who Jesus is to you. Your destiny rests upon your decision. You must decide for yourself who Jesus is to you. Your destiny rests upon that decision. By now, the crowd had gathered. We even see the phrase Jesus used many times coming up in the next verse. 
And we, as we saw earlier, uh, amen, amen. Remember that? Verily, verily in some translations, but always meaning I tell you all of this, I tell all of you the absolute truth. And so verse four, 24 starts with that phrase. The King James translation, translates it. New King James translates it most assuredly. So it's most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. I love it. Okay. He doesn't miss the chance to tell the good news of eternal life once the crowd is gathered around. Jesus has just spoken about doing his father's will, God's work here, and now tells everyone that those who hear and believe Remember what that means? Trust in, cling to, rely upon him has already, everybody who does this has already overcome death, spiritual death, separation from God, and they are already living an eternal life with Jesus Christ. If this describes you, you're no longer a resident of this planet. Your home is with God and will be forever. <laughs> that is good news. Jesus tells us, even more about what will happen in the future. He says in verse 25, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, and he, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the son of man. Jesus is the one that the father has granted authority in giving life. This is the second time he's repeated that in a short, short time. Well, think about that for a minute. Remember back in our first study, John chapter one, verse four, it says, in him was life and Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. Again, that wasn't just pretty poetry. Jesus is literally the one in charge of giving life and withholding life. So he's telling people that those present, that in a coming hour, sometime in the future, there's going to be, you know, that, that coming hour we studied back in chapter 2, a coming hour being kind of unmistakable proof that Jesus, divine, Jesus is divine and that God's great plan is revealed. In a coming hour, in a big way, many dead will rise. Plus, he adds, those that are present won't even have to wait until that hour because he said, and now is. Which means that some will rise from the dead even before the uh, big reveal, so to speak, <laughs> that's going to happen later on. And yes, we will see Jesus bring completely, totally departed not just sick, but dead people, that our bodies are rotting in the grave, we're gonna see them bringing those back from beyond the grave. But there's something else we hear, we see here. Do dead men hear things? <laughs> well, the answer, what Jesus just said here is that if Jesus is talking to them, the answer is absolutely yes. And when they hear his voice, however that happens, their very life will come back into them. Jesus was and is the living word of God. He has a limited authority, power, and wisdom. Many years after John wrote down this conversation we're studying today, Jesus to chose to reveal himself to John again, but without the res restraints, without Jesus being in the constraints of a physical human body. In verses 17 and 18, in Revelation chapter one, John recounts this, and I'll read it in the Amplified to try to capture a fuller meaning. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, and he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, absolute deity, the son of God and the ever living one, living in and beyond all time and space. I died, but see, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of absolute control and victory over death and of Hades, the realm of the dead. You could probably, probably spend an hour studying that or more studying that out easily. I wish I had the time and the knowledge 
and the understanding to, to dig into, to dive into more of this, but I'm gonna to try to be brief here. From what I understand, the souls of the saints who died in the old days before Jesus and up to the crucifixion, um, they, when they were died believing in the promise of the Messiah, trusting in God and his righteousness, were received into a pleasant place where they were conscious, they knew what was going on around them, but they were still apart from their old worn out human bodies. I think this place would rightfully be called paradise since that's what Jesus promised to, to the man that was crucified next to him that believed in him, they would go to, to paradise. But the unrighteous were placed in a place of torment that's commonly called Hades. Now I know there's a, there's a Greek God called Hades, but Jesus you know, talked about what people could relate to. So people understood Hades as a place of the dead, where dead people were at. So uh, that's why he used that terminology. But apparently, uh, and Jesus talked about this, he said that people could see from one of these places to the other, but they could not travel from one to the other. And we see a graphic description of it where Jesus told the story, not a parable, but told the story in Luke chapter 19. You can jot that down to study out further because it's a, it's a story that uh, you'll get a lot from. And we also see that that's not their final destination. In the bosom of Abraham where Lazarus was and the rich man was in torment. But we also see in Matthew chapter 27, which occurred after Jesus told the story about the rich man and Lazarus. You see in Matthew 27, after Jesus yielded up his spirit on the cross, verse 51 says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of their graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Wow. <laughs> Do you remember the last thing Jesus said before he yielded up his, his spirit? It is finished. The price is paid. It's done. I think that was it. That was all it took. And what Jesus is referring to in verse 25 when he says, The hour is coming when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. We see that. We also have another day looking forward to, uh, to that happening again. So we're not, we're, we're not talking about that now. That's a little later on in the scriptures. But the people here had never seen such a thing happen, especially those, those who were right present with them. They may have heard and read, or probably heard if they weren't reading, uh, a few of the people mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures that were brought back to life very shortly after death. Um, and incidentally, there, there are four accounts of that happening. All four of them, I've checked it out, all four of them were related to Elijah's ministry. And some, Elisha, which is part of Elijah's extension ministry, basically, um, which probably accounts for how revered Elijah had always been to the Jews. But people who had been dead for a few minutes, no, that didn't happen. Rotting bodies for years, no, that, that didn't happen before. And by simply hearing Jesus' voice, hearing the voice of someone telling him, no, that was never heard of before. Many people were here listening to him. Most had either witnessed the miraculous healing of the man who had been afflicted for 38 years, or at least had seen him walking, or, or maybe had heard about it from someone else. And they said, hey, come see this man that just healed this, this man. My guess is, is, is that as Jesus spoke these things, this, this crowd was standing there, and he was talking about, Multitudes of people being raised would be raised from the dead, and they're just like <laughs> their mouth hanging open. But Jesus continued, verse 28, saw their response and says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Ah, here we go. We're going further into the future. All who are and it doesn't say that yeah, for all who are, will hear his voice and come forth, verse 29, and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now, like I mentioned, when we get to the book of Revelation, we'll get detailed accounts. But we see here that Jesus is further revealing that it won't just be 
the saints of old who will be given life. He will also give eternal life to righteous in the future. Who? Who did Jesus say would receive eternal life? Those that believed in him. Those who have died in their sins and are in an evil state will get a taste of that life. It says that those you know, have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. They're going to get a taste of that life again, but never having gotten right with God, they're destined for eternal condemnation. I don't want to be in that group. Okay, I don't want any of you to be in that group. Many have said that the worst thing about living in an eternity without Jesus is not so much that they ended up in the lake of fire, but that they had seen the life that they could have experienced by trusting in Jesus and it turned it down. It gives us a life lesson to think about here today, and that is trust in Jesus every day for everything right now while you can. Then when you hear his voice, enjoy the eternal life that only he can give you. Trust in Jesus every day for everything right now while you can. Then when you hear his voice, enjoy the eternal life that only he can give you. Jesus finishes discussing these things. He comes back again and emphasizes how intertwined his actions and his will has been with God the Father. He's making sure everyone knew that these two persons of the threefold Godhead were in one accord, they're inseparable, and virtually indistinguishable from one another. Verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, which he means from God the Father, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So that's, that's a pretty much of an exclamation point <laughs> on some awesome teaching from Jesus today. Next time, we're gonna continue on. We'll, we'll start with the, the four witnesses that will verify uh, all that he is saying, all that Jesus is saying, and all that he's doing. But today, I, I pray that you've caught another glimpse into the glory and the authority and the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope this inspires you to continue or to start, if you haven't much, uh, studying more and more of the Word of God. Just in reading these passages, I can, you know, I can, I can picture in my heart and mind uh, a, a glow in the face of Jesus as he is telling people of the marvelous things that are to come and all that he has in store for those who believe. So the question is, for me, for you, do we, do you believe in, rely on, cling to, fully trust in Jesus? I hope so. I want to rise up every day. And I thank God and thank God for what Jesus has done for me. Let him know I trust him for everything. And if it's not your desire, take a few moments to meditate on these things and jumpstart your relationship with God. There's no better time than right now to, to start doing something along this line. But for now, as we're finishing up, I want to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thanks for being with us today. If there's anything you'd like to pray about or Mitzi and I to pray, we'd love to pray with you and God bless you. Thanks for being here.